This is The Secret Life of Language, a podcast from the University of Melbourne's School of Languages and Linguistics. A key word is a word or concept of great significance. Our Keywords project follows ever-changing words for an ever-changing world. COVID-19 is the most significant global event in recent history, and it is already affecting how people speak, write, and think. Each episode of Keywords is an expertly curated deep dive into a word that matters in a post-pandemic world. In this podcast, we will examine words that are exciting at the moment, words that shape and inform our everyday life. We would like to acknowledge the owners of the land we are working and living on, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who have been its custodians for many thousands of years. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Welcome to the second episode of the Keywords podcast. My name is Craig Jeffrey. I'm a professor of geography at the University of Melbourne, and my co-host is Professor Veronique Boucher, who is the A.R. Chisholm Professor of French, also at the University of Melbourne. Veronique and I are organizing a series of podcasts on key words for understanding the world today, especially understanding the world as it emerges out of the post-COVID, we hope, out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, And what we'll be doing is using these important words to open up debate and conversation on the nature of the world, but also will be focused quite a lot on the words themselves and how we understand those words. Getting perspectives from different scholars, perhaps challenging you to think about words that are very familiar to you in new ways. So throughout the Nothing series of podcasts, we're interested in what nothing means and also how what looks like nothing can actually be something and how nothing can be productive. We have two fantastic guests to talk about nothing from their own perspectives today. One is Dr. Ruth Singer, who works at the School of Languages and Linguistics at the University of Melbourne, and she's going to be talking particularly about Aboriginal language. And our second guest is the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, Professor Duncan Maskell, who will be talking about nothing and science. I think you're really going to enjoy our conversations both with Ruth and Duncan. So uh, thank you, Ruth, for joining us. Dr. Ruth Singer is a postdoctoral fellow in Indigenous Documentation. She is based in the School of Languages and Linguistics at the University of Melbourne, and she is working on a dictionary of the Nang language spoken in a small but highly multilingual Indigenous Australian community in Northwest Arnhem Land. So, is there in your dictionary? a word for nothing. Yes, well, in Maung, there is quite an important word called alara, which is often translated as nothing, but it's it's kind of bigger than nothing in English. So how is it bigger? What does it include? Well, it's just sort of a very useful kind of word. For example, if you ask somebody something, like a yes, no question, they could say yes or no, or they could say alara. So it sort of covers... I guess, negative existentials and that kind of thing. So there isn't any of something or or something doesn't exist, that kind of thing. And, and which words are connected to this nothing? Is, is there a semantic bubble around this word? Well, I guess it's not so much just about the English nothing is more about uh, things, but this is more about, I guess, anything. So uh, events not being the case. Or, um, you know, if something doesn't work or or doesn't happen for some reason. I was just transcribing an interview recently where um, a linguist was interviewing someone at What Are We, a different linguist, and they were asked about this language which people don't know much about. Did the linguist record this certain old person talking this language, which we don't really have any records of? And and he said to the linguist, did you did you record him speaking this language or, or anything or alara? 
or just nothing, you know, none of those things which I guess I'm hoping for <laughs> are the case. <laughs> and are, are there different words close to nothing that we wouldn't normally associate with, with these kind of words? Even though you use alara a lot to um, negate things, there's also negative particles and the word for no exist as well. There's also sort of words for not doing things, like not knowing or not being aware of things, not wanting to do something. So there's a couple of interesting words that sort of have inherently in their meaning, not give, to not give something. So you have uh, studied Aboriginal languages. Are there some common traits between these languages or is each language very different from the other? Well, I think having a special word for nothing actually is pretty common because I think in Australian Creole, which is the indigenous language with the most speakers, I think they have nudging or something similar. So I think it is pretty common to have this kind of big word for nothing that has a lot of uses. And another thing which Jenny Green noted, who's a linguist in the department specialising in Indigenous sign language, is that there's usually, most people have a sign for this. Okay, would you be able to describe this sign? Well, I have to admit when she mentioned this that I had trouble imagining what the sign was. I'm sure I would recognise it when people used it, but I'm not quite sure what it is. <laughs> but I think the interesting thing about these sign languages, which she's doing research on at the moment, is that they seem to be used sometimes between different language groups. So even people from quite far away areas, far apart areas, will have some signs in common. And she's looking at what kind of signs are more widespread. So like some are understood almost across the whole continent and then others are, are just a small area. So it would be interesting to know if, if these nothing signs are shared widely. Maybe this is a difficult question to answer, but when one thinks about nothing in English, it's often a word that has sort of negative connotations or it's something that unsettles people. Now, something just on the face of it seems better than nothing. Mm. Does that resonate at all with your work and, and analysis of language? Yeah, I think it's often, Alara in Maung is often used in response to a request for something. So obviously then it's, it's a bit negative, but I, I pulled out a few examples from the Maung Dictionary, which I'm working on, and it doesn't have to be negative. One of them is I was dizzy before, but now nothing. So actually I'm better now. Oh, <laughs> so I guess it doesn't have to be sometimes something not being there is, is good. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and will people also talk about it like it more as a sort of verb, like doing nothing? Is that something that's often discussed? Not really. You can make a sort of construction out of it, like you say, alara, ja, something, but it's, it's more of a nominal predicate, so there isn't any such and such. Right, right. But it is, it's interesting because there is a way of saying that someone doesn't do something, which I found very confusing at first, which is you say, you know, you talk about something, you know, and so someone's expected to do something in the story or whatever, and then they say, and so she sat. And what this actually means is she, she didn't do that thing, which you would expect her to do based on the story or which someone asked her to do whatever. And so they seem to use that sitting as sort of not doing what has, what's sort of implicated you have to work out. That's very interesting because um, in Hindi, which I'm so sort of familiar with, they often use intensifiers, so other verbs to attach to an initial verb to strengthen or, or suggest additional meaning. So the, the idea of, of sitting is quite often used, for example, if you've lost money, you don't just lose it, but the money has sort of sat down. And the sense is that, you know, it's, you've really lost it. And, and sitting, yeah. sitting is often Stop used forever. as an intensifier to describe those kinds of circumstances. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what these different posture verbs become in different languages. I guess it's a bit like that sort of colloquial expression. It's gone pear-shaped. You know, it's a sort of sense of something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe money is meant to be moving, so somehow sitting is just wrong. And, and I guess um, sort of also one thing that we've been talking about inevitably when thinking about nothing is just that sort of more abstract kind of question about how people perceive absence 
silence, sort of space, the, the absence of, you know, feature, noise, meaning. Can you comment at all on that in terms of your, your work and analysis? It's a tricky one, I guess. We're just talking about things which are... Well, one thing that we have talked about sometimes when we're talking about languages that aren't spoken anymore, you know, what happens because one of the things I've been working on is, you know, the the role of languages in um, Indigenous people's conception of the world, I guess, in Arnhem Land. And one of the things is that languages always belong to a certain area of land. And so what happens to that land when that language isn't spoken anymore? And that's one situation where, you know, one of the old people we interviewed about it was like, well, it's, it's sort of like a big absence, like there's nothing there for that land because, you know, that language isn't being spoken, that's a part of that land anymore. Gosh, that's, that's really chilling to think about that sort of silence of, of when a language stops. Yes, because the interesting thing in Arnhem Land is everyone still speaks Indigenous languages, so it's sort of a success story in some ways or it's a, it's a story of survival. But on the other hand, uh, a lot of small languages aren't spoken and people have shifted to other languages. So people are still speaking Indigenous languages all around Arnhem Land, but not necessarily each language of each place. Is there any trace of those lost languages, either in recordings or in words that survive in, in languages that continue? Well, one of the things I've been working on, it was about a language called Manangari, which a lot of people in the coast of Western Arnhem Land have, have mentioned who've worked with me and other linguists, is Manangari language. But apart from the name, we don't have much else. People have written down a few words. Uh, so we really don't know whether it was similar to some of the languages that we know more about or similar to Mao. People say it's similar to Mao, but how similar? It hasn't been spoken for a few generations, so people don't have a very clear memory of it. But what's interesting is they have this strong sense of, of loss, I think. And Manangari has become, I think, the reason people talk about it so much, even though they don't have forms of the language still, but they talk about it so much because it sort of represents some of that generational loss, I guess, a sense that the elders knew things which which aren't known today. This has been absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm just reminded of, you know, in terms of lost languages, thinking of David McInnes's work on lost plays and, you know, thinking about how how something that's gone can continue to leave an imprint in terms of people's attitudes or behaviour. Yeah, I think it it really is because I guess the more I started talking to people about this Manangari language, the more I felt like it wasn't just an absence of linguists having written anything down, which obviously was was a lack, but also just how powerful it was, I guess, how, how important it was to people despite this. Yeah. And um, I'm looking forward to reading this dictionary, Ruth. <laughs> it should be out next year. <laughs> Great. So do you invent a phonetics or how do you do Oh, no, because the writing system um, was developed, I think, in the, um, in the 50s. There was a missionary linguist who started working on Mao. And it, it follows very much other Indigenous language writing systems. Okay, so here we be a very important person with this dictionary, with a whole memory of uh, language and the, and the culture. That's fantastic. Well, hopefully it won't be just me who's important, but also the, the Maon people who've been involved. <laughs> so congratulations, Ruth, for your research. And thank you again for joining us today for our conversation about nothing. Thank you, Ruth. Lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time. That was, that was absolutely fascinating. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Duncan Maskell, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, to the podcast, the Keywords podcast. And Duncan and I have talked before about the importance of nothing as an idea. We've discussed this as a way of thinking about how academics from different disciplines push forward their research. And we've talked about nothing as a way of actually bringing different academics together to think about how the world is changing and, and how science and social science works. So really delighted, Duncan, that you could join us for the, for the podcast. And I wanted just to start by asking you how you got interested in nothing and how it figures in your work and thinking. So my interest in nothing started actually with music, like many things in my life. When I was a sort of teenager and learning to play music, 
There was a moment when I discovered the uh, very important issue of placement of notes, making sure that notes go in precisely the right place. So you'd be surprised, but you know, when you hear a fantastic top player or orchestra, they sound great partly because everyone's placing their notes in exactly the one single point of precision uh, where that note belongs. And that immediately made me think that there were also a range of other places that note could be placed. And if the note wasn't placed in those other places, then what was going on in that space, if you see what I mean? And so, I mean, this is a bit esoteric, I'm sorry, but it's kind of, <laughs> then that made me consider further the business of, of, of quiet and silence in music. And in fact, a lot of music, if you think about it, relies enormously on the silences as well as the, the noise. And without some of those silences, music is a, just a mush of, well, it's a racket, right? Uh, that, then that, of course, leads inevitably, and this is probably going to sound really uh, boring and hackneyed, but it leads to four minutes and 33 seconds. Yeah. And, uh, you know, John Cage. And as a youngster, I thought, this man is mad. Uh, as, a, as a more sophisticated grown-up, I think this man is mad, but actually <laughs> in, with purpose. And, um, you know, four minutes 33, I don't know if you ever had a performance of four minutes 33, but it is absolutely fantastic mm. because you start out thinking this is a joke. But towards the end of the four minutes and 33 seconds of silence, as the chap sat there at the piano, you start halfway through, you start hearing people shuffling and then they start coughing. And then you hear the ambient sounds of the air conditioning. And then you might hear, hear the bus going by outside the concert hall, even though it's supposed to be soundproofed. And then you start hearing things that maybe you don't know what they are, you know. <laughs> and, and, and that's the whole point of the piece. It, there is not, in, in that context, it's, a silence, it's absolute silence in, in the written music, but there's no silence. There's all stuff going on out there. So, you know, what is nothing? Nothing is an absolute, but we often use the word nothing to talk about things that are not really absolute. Yeah. Uh, misuse the term in, those, in that sense. So that's where it really started. I've always been fascinated by cosmology and space. And so I've always struggled with, with vacuum. I've always struggled with what's outside the universe. I've always struggled with what is the material between the, the large bodies that are created in the universe and those kinds of things. So again, in fact, you know, as far as I'm right off my expertise here, so this could be very naive and wrong, but my understanding is that the current view is, that, of course, there is a, a quite a lot of stuff between the, the bodies that we see. It's just not easily measurable or indeed measurable at all, particularly, but, you know, the dark matter idea and everything else that's out there. That still doesn't answer the question, what's outside the universe? And it doesn't then, that, that then leads to another aspect of this, which I'm, I've always been really interested in, which is the philosophy. So, so, you know, you start to then get down to the question of, is there anything outside the universe? You know, is the universe actually all there is? And that's hard for human beings to conceptualise because we always set boundaries. We, we are bounded beings, and I think we therefore struggle with anything that might not have a boundary or a start and a finish. Mm. And, you know, this goes right back to the, to the ancient philosophers, you know, Parmenides. Mm. It, it, is an empty world possible? Are, are vacuums possible? You know, and then right back to the sort of core question for any philosophical system or any religion or anything, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, and, and, you know, it, it goes on and on and on in those terms. Yeah, I mean, I think the time element of this is really interesting as well, isn't, isn't it? You know, thinking about what was there before the Big Bang, what was the once nothing that has become something and will something then return to nothing? And I guess on a sort of human scale that, that relates to the question of the, the ultimate nothing of what happens after we die. Or indeed, what, what was happening before we were born. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> I'm very relaxed about my own personal death uh, because I don't remember anything nasty happening before I was born. So the I in that is embodied in my, in my body and my brain as far as I'm concerned as a sort of ultra-rationalist. Well, we practice every day with sleep as well, don't we? That's right. If you're getting any sleep at the moment. <laughs> no, well, I wasn't going to say that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing that sort of was implicit, I guess, in what you were talking about when you talked about the audience listening to 4 Minutes 33 is, you know, how unaccustomed we are in some ways to, to various forms of, of nothing, like silence, or we don't necessarily focus on them very much. And I think maybe partly as a result of that, people tend to find nothing quite uh, unsettling and uncomfortable and, and don't see the, the value in nothing. Do you have any reflections on, on that observation? I mean, the sort of the value of nothing and the importance maybe of, of not feeling unsettled by nothing. Well, again, you know, philosophers would, would, would argue about this, but I think nothing exists in, 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 as a concept. Okay? 
although there are there are philosophers out there who would argue that you can't have a philosophy of nothing because by definition nothing is nothing so you can't have an argument about it i think this is an interesting issue in terms of you know how do you represent nothing so in mathematics zero we're all familiar with zero mm. you will understand what that means it doesn't give us too much of a problem to consider zero except when you try and divide by zero and then that really doesn't really um, <laughs> uh, but um you know the number zero didn't exist until somebody invented it mm. and I, I don't know i don't know what the current finalized view is whether it was i think it was either uh, somebody in the arab world or, or somebody in, in india yeah. who, who um, invented zero and i think there's a some form of discussion around that, but you know, until until zero was invented, we didn't have that concept. Yeah. Or, or probably we did have the concept, we just didn't have the notation or the way of using that concept in a in a way. Yeah. Um, so how did the Romans deal with it? Romans didn't have zero in their numerical system. Did they consider nothing, or did they not? Did they not have the concept of nothing? Maybe they had the concept. You know, maybe the, maybe the cosmos is 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 the fabric of the stars. You know. Yeah. Maybe their philosophical system was one of, of, of afterlife in one way or another. So maybe they had an idea that, that and many other philosophies and religions in the world have, a, have an idea of continuing something. You know, so when you die, you do either have an afterlife or you have a, a you're, you're, or you're reincarnated or whatever it is. So maybe different philosophies and different religions deal with the concept of nothing by denying it and trying to make a system whereby there's always something. Yeah. I've been reading about how zero arrived in Europe during the Renaissance and people called it dark Saracen magic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although they must have had the concept of, you know, if, if, if five minus five equals zero, then w- what was the concept that they had when they had five of something and took five of it away? They must have had that mathematical concept. Yeah. It's such a fundamental mathematical concept. Yeah. What do they call that? Outcome. Well, that, that set us some homework. We need to, <laughs> we need to investigate this. Um, we think, I think we need to source a mathematician. We haven't had a mathematician on the podcast yet. It's, I mean, that's a really interesting. Get a mathematical physicist as well, because, you know, the, the old Niels Bohr model of the atom, you know, Bohr's model of the atom had a, had a sort of nucleus and an w- electron whizzing around it, which, which immediately begs the question, what's between the electron and the proton? Nothingness, presumably. But, of course, one, once Bohr's... Um, Amazing work was then modified by people like um, Heisenberg and Schrodinger and people like that. You start to get to a much more complicated, difficult, and sophisticated understanding of these things. These things are not actually particles. You know, they are they're probability functions, effectively. <laughs> they're electromagnetic fields defined by a probability function, and so that really challenge. That's really challenging in terms of there is not say, there is no space between an electron and proton. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a it's a probabilistic field. Yeah. And, you know, that starts to ask other questions about the concept of nothing, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I think another thing that we've, we've sort of been thinking about, partly in, in relation to the etymology of the word nothing, is that the actual Old English word thing didn't just mean stuff, but also had the connotation of assembly. Oh. So there is this sort of, if you look back far enough historically, this idea that nothing is actually the, the lack of the assembly of people or of something, which adds an extra interesting layer when one thinks about nothing, even in terms of thinking about particles. Very interesting, isn't it? Because, of course, you know, um, laws of thermodynamics and entropy, the law of entropy says says that all the energetic states are tending to randomness. And eventually the universe will wind up as uh, the ultimate cold object with no no particular energy. Energy equally distributed across the universe. So, so in point of fact, to generate anything observable as a thing, you do have to assemble that energy and that matter. Mm-hmm. And in the context of this, matter and energy are sort of part, in some sense, interchangeable. You do have to assemble that into these things. Yeah. That's another fascinating thing about you know, the Big Bang. What were the statistical anomalies that happened during the Big Bang that led to accretions of energy and matter into objects rather than just staying random? During your research, when you do an experiment and nothing happens, uh, is it good? <laughs> if you set up your experiment properly, you never have a one-sided question. So, first of all, nothing could happen in the sense that you don't get the readout you're expecting. That's just technical. You're just going to go do your job better. But um, the hypothesis that you're setting up should be a hypothesis that the experiment you're doing will be informative about one way or the other, no matter what the result is. 
So, uh, you know, that's the ideal way of doing it. And carnivals do that. But so what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that in experimental science, uh, the, the nothing option should be off the, off the table as much as it possibly can be. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thanks so much, Duncan, for coming and, and talking about this. It's been really fascinating. And I think you've shown us that there's a lot of mileage in actually using this to generate all sorts of interesting cross-disciplinary conversations, which is the purpose of this in many respects. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. For more info and other episodes, head to the Secret Life of Language website. Licensed under Creative Commons, copyright, University of Melbourne, 2021.